I, well, I know we've still probably people coming in, but let's maybe go ahead and, and get started because I know you have a lot of information to share. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Christina Irving with Family Caregiver Alliance. For those of you who might not be familiar with, with us, we are a nonprofit based in San Francisco and serving uh, the six counties of the Bay Area, providing support to families who are caregiving for people with long-term chronic illnesses, dementia, um, stroke, Parkinson's, and, and other um, chronic conditions. So we provide assessment, support, and education to family caregivers. And we know one of the common challenges with families is that many of them are juggling work and caregiving. And, you know, we know not as many caregivers are utilizing paid family leave. So we're really excited to be partnering with Legal Aid at Work around this project and providing more education to families and for providers who are working with family caregivers. So I'm going to turn it over um, to our presenters today so we can get started. Um, Sharon Terman is Director of the Work and Family Program and Senior Staff Attorney at Legal Aid at Work. She provides legal advice to workers in low-wage jobs, represents employees facing family medical crises, advocates for policy change to promote family-friendly workplaces, and educates the community through trainings, know your rights materials, and technical assistance. Sharon is an expert on family and medical leave policies and has helped craft several landmark laws to improve California's work family policies, including the expansion of paid family leave benefit and job protected leave. And then Sayla Seeger is a staff attorney in the work and family program at Legal Aid at Work. She provides legal advice and representation to pregnant workers and new parents, workers struggling with family and medical crises, and survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, she often presents trainings on new parent and caregiving leave laws and engages in policy advocacy to advance the rights of working families. So thank you both for being here and sharing this information. Um, and we're really excited to hear everything that you're going to teach us today. I'll turn it over to you both. Thank you so much, Christina. We're also very, very excited to be partnering with uh, Family Caregiver Alliance as well as the AARP Foundation, um, which has provided generous support for this work. Um, so um, I, before we jump in, wanna just share a little background about Legal Aid at Work. We are a nonprofit legal advocacy organization. Um, we've been around for over a hundred years. We're based in San Francisco. Um, we help folks throughout the state of California. And our focus is on advancing the workplace rights and well-being of families with low incomes. Um, we have a number of different substantive program areas and Sela and I work in the work and family program where we empower family caregivers and pregnant and parenting workers to take the leave and accommodations they need um, to take care of themselves and to take care of their loved ones without having to jeopardize their economic security. Um, we uh, have a work and family helpline, um, which um, provides free confidential legal advice and information to workers across the state of California who have questions or concerns around issues related to caregiving. Um, so really, we'll share that helpline with you um, throughout this webinar and encourage you all to call and to refer the folks you work with. Um, to call the helpline for individualized assistance in multiple languages. Um, we also represent folks. So if their rights are violated, let's say they're denied paid family leave or their employer fires them for taking leave, um, we can represent people, um, try to help them get their jobs back, get them the leave that they're entitled to. Um, and then we do a number of uh, trainings and outreach and community education like this. Um, and we also engage in policy advocacy to improve workplace protections for caregivers and others. Um, and we'll talk today and highlight some of the recent changes to the law that we've been working on with our coalition partners and the Work and Family Coalition. Um, one, of, one of the attendees already noted one of those changes, which we'll highlight today. Um, and so we're really excited to, to be here um, with all of you and share this information. Um, so uh, today's webinar is going to focus on um, a couple different topics. Um, one is paid family leave. Um, 
And the other is job protected leave from work. And these are unfortunately kind of two separate concepts that folks have to have in mind when they're talking about leave from work. One is where do you get your money when you're taking leave? And the other is, will you have a job to go back to when you're taking this leave? Um, and we're focusing, of course, on leave for family caregivers to care for family members with serious illnesses. Um, it, as Christina alluded to, um, this can be a very challenging moment in folks' lives when a loved one is diagnosed with a serious illness. Um, and many people, particularly people with low income, um, are often faced with really impossible choices about whether they can keep their jobs that they need to support their families or um, whether they can be there for their families. And um, many people aren't aware that we do have some really important protections in California for folks who are experiencing these um, family medical crises. And so um, well, paid family leave has been around for uh, about 20 years in California, but most folks use it for baby bonding. It's really underutilized for caregiving, although that is a key part of why this law exists. Um, and so we wanna make sure that um, family caregivers are aware of it, know how to access it, and that um, the health and social service providers that serve them and work with them every day are equipped to help support them in accessing these rights. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, paid family leave, leave from work with job protection, and, um, and then we'll go over some common questions and examples. So um, just to reiterate, these are our objectives. We want you to be able to identify the difference between and purposes of paid family leave benefits and job protected leave from work to understand how to support family caregivers in accessing this leave and um, learn where to refer folks for additional assistance and resources. Um, so as we go through um, the presentation today, we're gonna refer to a couple terms that we wanna just define at the outset. Um, I've alluded already to um, caring for folks with a serious health condition or a serious illness. So, what does that mean within the, the meaning of paid family leave and these job protected leave laws? Um, essentially, it, it is a broad category. There's not a, a finite list of conditions that qualify, um, but it can mean um, any number of conditions that require ongoing treatment by a healthcare provider. It also could mean um, any kind of inpatient care, any condition requiring an overnight stay in any kind of um, healthcare facility. So some common examples are Alzheimer's or other cognitive impairments, cancer, um, cognitive, con uh, sorry, chronic conditions, um, and recovery from surgery. And then what does it mean to care for someone with a serious illness? Um, caregiving, of course, can involve helping with daily um, life activities. It can involve helping with um, medical needs transporting someone to healthcare appointments, um, but it also can include planning for um, future care, um, changes in care, providing relief to other caregivers, and importantly, it also includes emotional support and psychological comfort and care. So really just being with someone who is experiencing a serious illness counts as care. So um, I want to jump in now to paid family leave. Um, as I mentioned, this is a program that's been around for um, almost two decades. Uh, it was actually enacted in 2002 and um, went into effect in 2004. Um, as it currently stands, the program provides eight weeks of partial wage replacement benefits each year while you are caring for a seriously ill family member bonding with a new child, or for certain military exigency needs. Um, today, we're going to be focusing on the caregiving for seriously ill family members piece. Um, the benefits that it provides um, are currently 60% of your income for most workers, 70% for the very lowest wage workers, um, 
However, we want to note a very exciting development as of late last year, um, which is legislation that will increase these benefit rates to 90% um, for most low and middle income workers in the state of California. This will go into effect in 2025. So um, stay tuned for more resources on that um, as that a deadline, as that uh, time approaches. But it's very, very important um, expansion of access to these rights because of course many low paid workers can't afford to take leave with um, a 30 or 40 percent pay cut. Um, it's really important to know that paid family leave does not have to be taken all at once and so of course a lot of family caregivers need leave maybe a week here or a day here to um, take their, their loved one to a chemotherapy appointment, for example, or physical therapy, um, or just for recovery for a couple of weeks um, after a surgery. So you can take this leave on a reduced schedule or intermittently. And immigration status is not an eligibility requirement for these benefits. We will talk a little later about some special um, guidelines for how to apply um, if you are undocumented. But it's important to know that um, as long as you have paid into the program, you are eligible to receive these benefits regardless of your immigration status. So who is a family member under paid family leave? Um, this law covers parents, including parents-in-law, um, spouses and registered domestic partners, children of any age, um, grandparents, grandchildren, and siblings. Um, this actually, as the, when the law was first enacted, it was a much narrower group of family members, um, but currently it has now been expanded to, to this larger group. Um, and I will talk later about um, a, a recent expansion to the list of family members but that applies to the job protected leave law. It doesn't yet apply to the paid family leave program. However, there's legislation currently um, to align those two definitions. Um, multiple people can take paid family leave to care for the same loved one. And so, for example, um, if you know someone, if an adult child's parent is sick. Um, and there are three children, um, they can all receive paid family leave to care for the same parent. Um, however, the Employment Development Department, which administers this program, um, will limit you to three people per 24 hour period. Um, so basically three eight hour shifts in a given 24 hour period. Um, Okay, so how can you qualify for paid family leave? Um, basically, there's kind of two main requirements. One is you need to be caring for a seriously ill family member who's covered, and you have to have paid into the state disability insurance fund. Most private employees in the state of California automatically pay in to paid family leave. And the way to check on that is by looking on your pay stub, and um, there should be a deduction that says something like CASDI or SDI. You have to have paid in during a specific look back period called a base period that is essentially five to 18 months before your claim begins. Um, however, you should know that um, if, you, if you didn't pay in during that period, there are certain circumstances where you can use an alternate base period. Um, and if folks have questions about that, um, happy to um, refer you to our helpline. Or and I should say that we're please feel free as we go to put questions in the chat, and we will try to save time at the end um, for questions and answers. And so, um, how do you apply for paid family leave? Um, well, as I mentioned, you apply through the Employment Development Department. Um, you can apply either online or with a paper application. Online is more efficient. Um, and uh, however, you can, you can apply with a paper application. You do need to um, 
You do need to request a paper application in general in, from the EDD, so there's a little delay in that, although healthcare providers and social service providers can, can request them in bulk, and so you can have them in your office to help people fill them out. Um, you don't have to apply right away. Um, you can apply essentially starting the day that your leave begins, um, and then up to 41 days later, or even beyond that with good cause. So for example, if you took a leave and you, um, and you uh, didn't, we weren't thinking about paid family leave, of course, you were thinking about your family member and being there with them. Maybe they had an urgent health issue. Um, you don't have to apply right away. Maybe you weren't even aware of paid family leave until months later. I would say apply include a letter with your application saying, I, I'm applying late because I didn't know this program existed or whatever your reason is, and, um, and hopefully your benefits will be granted. Um, your healthcare provider the, or the, the care recipient healthcare provider does need to certify the claim, which will essentially just say, yes, my patient has a serious health condition, and that condition warrants the care of their family member. I mentioned earlier that undocumented workers are eligible as long as they've paid in. Um, if you don't have a social security number, there's a special process you need to follow, which is essentially using a paper application, leaving blank the question asking for your social security number, and attaching proof of wages. And we have a um, a special guide that we will um, link to later in this presentation that takes folks through those steps about how to apply um, without a social security number. All right, this just shows the application, what, what the paper application looks like. There's a portion that you fill out. There's a portion that the care recipient should fill out. And then on the next slide is um, what the healthcare certification looks like. Um, next slide. Okay, yeah, so that's the healthcare certification. Um, and, and so one thing about this certification is that it, it goes to the employment development department. It does not go to the caregiver's employer. Um, and so one thing that I'll highlight in a little bit is that um, the healthcare provider may actually have to fill out two certifications. Um, one that goes to the EDD so that the worker can get these benefits, and the other may be to the employer. And those certifications will look different, most notably by, because the certification to the EDD must include the diagnosis or a detailed statement of symptoms. The certification that goes to the employer for medical privacy reasons does not need to disclose that information. Instead, it just needs to say, this person has a serious health condition within the meaning of the law. All right, next slide. Okay, so now that we've talked about paid family leave, um, I'm gonna turn to job protected leave from work. And the main law that we think about um, in California for job protected leave from work is the California Family Rights Act. And this is the state version of the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act. But the reason why we talk exclusively or primarily about California Family Rights Act is because it is broader in who it covers. Um, if you're eligible for both laws, then great, you get protections under both laws. You don't, however, get, um, in general, you wouldn't get two separate sets of leave. Um, they would generally run concurrently. Um, so this leave is actually 12 weeks per year um, to care for a family member with a serious health condition. It also covers the other reasons, bonding with a new child for certain military deployment related reasons and caring for your own serious health condition. Um, if you're covered by this law, your employer has to continue your health benefits during your leave. So that means under the same terms that you um, had health insurance before your leave, those must be continued. So if they paid a portion of the premium um, and you paid a portion of the premium, they will continue to pay their portion of the premium during your leave, but you also need to continue to pay your portion. Um, you also must be returned to the same or virtually identical job after your leave. So this law does not provide 
pay. It doesn't require your employer to pay you during the leave. What it does is it says you have to give them the leave and give them their job back after the leave. And you can't retaliate against them or treat them worse because they took this leave um, in addition to continuing those health benefits. And so I see a question that I'll, I'll just answer now to, to um, clear up confusion. So, um, and as I mentioned, there's two different things to be mindful of. There's the um, paid family leave program, which is your money benefits from the EDD uh, when you're taking time off to care for someone. That program provides eight weeks of, um, of partial wage replacement each year while you're caring for a seriously ill loved one. But the job protection law, the California Family Rights Act provides 12 weeks of job protected leave law. And so I'll show a slide in a little bit that shows how these things work together. Um, essentially, if you're, if you're matching them up, which you should do, then you get 12 weeks of leave. And for eight of those weeks, you can get paid family leave from the state. Um, the other four weeks would either be unpaid or you, if you have accrued pay from your employer, you could draw down those benefits at that time. Um, so I alluded earlier that there's a slightly broader definition of family under the job protected leave law, the California Family Rights Act. Um, it covers essentially all the same folks that are covered under paid family leave, but as a result of a new law that was passed um, just last year, as of January 1 in 2023, um, you also can take leave to care for a chosen family member that the employee designates. Um, so this can really be anyone whose close association with the employee is equivalent to a family relationship. Um, and it, the employer can limit you to one designated person that you care for each year. Um, you can designate that person essentially at the moment you're taking leave. Um, so this is a really important expansion um, that recognizes the you know, reality of many families um, who don't fit the traditional nuclear family mold um, and the fact that we all need care and all need to care for our loved ones, whether or not they're related by blood um, or marriage. So um, this is important to, to let folks know about. I, I, sh I should say too, though, just to reiterate, we are working on legislation this year to align the definition in paid family leave. So stay tuned. Hopefully, um, we will have those definitions aligned and starting next year, um, fingers crossed, um, folks will also be able to get paid family leave benefits to care for a chosen family member. Um, okay, how do you qualify for leave from work for that job protected leave? you need to meet three requirements. Um, first, you have to work for an employer with at least five employees. Um, this may sound um, new to some of you because it is. Um, as of just a couple of years ago, 2021, um, this employee threshold was reduced um, from 50 to five. So 50 within 75 miles to five, regardless of where the employees are. So it's a huge expansion. Um, we and our partners um, in the Work and Family Coalition worked really hard on this for a number of years to try to expand access because we kept hearing from folks who worked for you know, smaller employers who were being told that by their employers, you can't take this leave, or if you take this leave, you're going to be fired. Um, and putting folks in really impossible situations. And so this expansion um, means that millions more Californians now have access to job protected leave, um, but many employers may not know about that and they just automatically assume, oh, we're smaller than 50 people and so therefore you don't get this leave. So um, it's a good opportunity for, for folks to educate their employers about this, this law. Um, the other two requirements are that you have to have worked for your employer for one year, and you have to have worked at least 1,250 hours in the year preceding your leave, which works out to be about 25 hours a week. Um, right. So how do you ask for job protected leave? Um, you basically should tell your employer, I need leave to care for my family member who has a serious health condition. That's all you need to say. 
um, you don't actually have to say under the California Family Rights Act, and you don't have to put it in writing under the law, but it's recommended. Uh, we recommend that you do put it in writing, document that, um, that you've had that conversation. If you want to talk in person or over the phone, just send an email or a text message later saying, thanks for talking with me today. As we discussed, I need to take leave to care for my family member with a serious health condition. Um, you should give your expected dates of leave, even if you're not entirely sure how long you'll need. You can say, my estimate is I'll need four weeks. Um, you can tell them if you need it on a reduced schedule or intermittently. Um, and you should give them enough advance notice. If it's foreseeable, you're supposed to give 30 days notice. So for example, if your loved one has a, a scheduled surgery, you should give 30 days notice for that. Or if it's not foreseeable, just give them notice as soon as you can. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a separate certification that uh, you may be required to provide um, for to the employer for the job protective leave. Um, and this certification essentially just says, yes, um, my patient has a serious health condition that warrants the employee's care. It should not disclose the diagnosis of the care recipient. And this slide, which we'll share later, actually has a link to a sample certification form that is legally sufficient under the California Family Rights Act. Um, and the employer is supposed to give the worker at least 15 calendar days to return that certification if they're trying in good faith and need longer than they're supposed to give them longer. All right, and this is uh, the slide that shows how paid family leave and job protected leave work together. Um, and so on the top is paid family leave, on the bottom is uh, job protected leave under the family, California Family Rights Act. Um, of course, this shows a continuous leave, but it's important to know you can take intermittent leave or leave on a reduced schedule. But if you're taking it continuous leave, you can get 12 weeks of job protected leave to care for your loved one with a serious illness. Your health benefits must be continued through that entire time. And for eight of those weeks, you can collect um, 60 or 70% of your wages through paid family leave. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Sela. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I'm going to move on now, but this is a really helpful timeline to just understand how things fit together. Um, so we're gonna move now to some examples. Um, our first person we're meeting is Lisa. So Lisa is a drugstore clerk that needs to take time off of work to care for her mom who has Alzheimer's. Lisa's mom can no longer live alone and Lisa needs leave from work to care for her while they search for a residential care facility and arrange for her mother's move. Lisa will need to be out of work full time for eight weeks. And um, let's see here. I wanted to ask a couple questions and see if folks would be willing to um, take a stab at answering them in the chat. So if you feel bold, um, feel free to pop your answer in the chat and we'll discuss. Um, but the first question is based on this scenario, is Lisa eligible for paid family leave? Great. I see a great answer here. Feel free to, to keep them trickling in. Um, and then the second question is, will her job be protected while she is on leave? Yes, great. Thanks so much for your participation. Awesome. So moving to the answer now, uh, is Lisa eligible for paid family leave? I like so many um, answers that I saw. The answer is yes. So Lisa is eligible for paid family leave through the EDD as long as she has paid into the SDI fund. Um, she can receive 60 or 70% of her income for the entire eight weeks. Um, and again, importantly, that will be increasing in 2025. So just really important to know about that um, and look out for that um, for the 90% wage increase. Um, and then second, will Lisa's job be protected while she is away from work? And I have to give applause to the audience for um, your great answers. Sometimes this can be tricky um, because the answer is maybe, um, because there are those eligibility requirements for the California Family Rights Act. So if Lisa's employer has five or more employees, if she has worked there for at least one year, 
and she has worked for at least 1,250 hours within the last 12 months. Her job will be protected under the California Family Rights Act for up to 12 weeks per year. So this slide talks about what Lisa specifically needs to do to keep her job safe and get paid. She should tell her employer that she needs leave to care for her mom with a serious health condition. Her employer may ask for a medical note from her mother's health care provider. Um, Lisa can apply for paid family leave online. Um, and here again is the website and we will share the slides um, or by requesting a paper application. Lisa's mom's health care provider will need to certify her claim to the EDD. Um, and I did see a question just about how, if you're doing an online application, the medical provider can provide that certification. I believe that that is also online. Um, and so the provider will um, submit that information um, online to the EDD as well. So moving to the next example, um, we're going to meet Carmen. Carmen is a bank teller and needs to take time off to care for her husband who has recently been diagnosed with cancer. She needs to take a few days off each week to take her husband to appointments and to help him manage daily tasks. So again, is Carmen eligible for paid family leave and will Carmen's job be protected while she is away from work? So feel free to drop your answers in the chat. Great. Thanks so much again for your participation. Um, answer to the first one is yes. Carmen can receive paid family leave while she takes time off to care for her husband and take him to appointments um, and provide care. Um, will Carmen's job be protected while she is away from work? Um, again, the answer is maybe based on those same eligibility requirements, um, five or more employees, at least one year on the job and have worked the minimum, the, the hours requirement of 1,250 hours during the last 12 months. Um, she can take CIFRA time, the California Family Rights Act time intermittently as well um, for the equivalent of 12 weeks maximum. So I'm glad you asked that question um, because we know that this is uh, a, something that comes up for a lot of folks of just how to apply for intermittent paid family leave. Um, so here are some steps to take um, if you need to apply for intermittent paid family leave. On the application, you will show that you want intermittent paid family leave by answering yes to the question, did you work or will you continue work during your family leave period? Um, then you can um, just inform folks who are applying that they can expect a call from the EDD after submitting their application um, who will, and the representative from the EDD will ask them additional questions about their leave. Um, and so they can be prepared for that. Um, importantly, the EDD, I believe, um, shows up as like a, a blocked number or undisclosed number. So you may want to just advise um, people that they should expect a number and it may be the EDD calling and pick it up. Um, and then they will certify sort of when they worked and how much they earned um, every two weeks through additional forms that are provided by the EDD. So now we're moving on to a third example. We're meeting Alex. Alex is a telephone operator at a company in San Francisco. He needs to take time off to work take time off work to help his father-in-law who is having surgery on his hip. Alex's father-in-law lives in Oregon. So Alex will need to take three weeks off to fly to Oregon, drive his father-in-law to and from the hospital for his surgery, and then care for him while he recovers. So is Alex eligible for paid family leave and will his job be protected while he is away from work? Great. Yes, Alex can receive 60 or 70% of his income for the three weeks he's away from work to help with his father-in-law surgery. Um, so importantly, even though Alex's father-in-law lives out of state, um, or even if this, for example, in this example, the care recipient lived out of the country, Alex can still um, apply for paid family leave. Um, and will Alex's job be protected while he is away from work? Again, the answer is maybe, um, depending on 
those eligibility requirements for the California Family Rights Act, five or more employees, has worked for at least a year and worked at least 1,250 hours within the last 12 months. So I wanted to move on now to a couple of common questions. Um, and the first one is, what if more than one person cares for a seriously ill family member? And so Sharon talked about this a little bit before, but um, more than one person can definitely provide care for the same care recipient and receive paid family leave. But an applicant can only receive benefit payments for the days and hours that they are the primary caregiver. And so the example that um, we used before about three adult children caring for their parent um, within those sort of um, eight hour shifts, so three within a 24 hour period. And I know there was a question earlier about whether or not that would affect sort of the full benefit amount for each of those people. Um, the answer is that those folks would each get their own full benefit amount um, for them, but there would be sort of a maximum eight hour period within a 24 hour, a maximum eight hour shift within a 24 hour period. Another common question we get is whether um, you can take paid family leave more than once. Um, and I know this is something that does come up. Um, and the answer is yes, um, you can take family leave up to eight weeks per year. So caregivers may apply, reapply each year if they continue to need time off to care for a seriously ill loved one. Um, however, the maximum is eight weeks per year. So um, if you need you know, eight weeks in an additional year, then that is fine and you should um, feel free to apply in the next year. Another question we often get is if you can apply for paid family leave and continue working part-time. And the answer is yes. Um, you can apply for paid family leave if you reduce your schedule to care for a seriously ill family member. If you will continue to work for any part of your leave, you should follow the steps on the earlier slide um, to file an intermittent leave claim. And you will continue to certify every two weeks using this form. I know it's small, but it's um, depicted here on the right um, that the EDD will send to you. How to talk to your employer about taking leave. Um, so if you're covered under the California Family Rights Act, Again, you can give your employer 30 days notice if, if it, you're able to, um, or as soon as possible, um, if it's, you know, if that it's something that's more urgent. Um, you just need to tell your employer, I need leave under the California Free Rights Act. But again, you don't need to use those magic words um, to give specific dates and then care for a family member with a serious health condition. Again, um, fine to have this conversation in person, um, but, or yeah, on the phone, but we do recommend that you follow up in writing with an email, text message, or letter. Um, and employers can then ask for a certification from your family member's healthcare provider. Um, and they have 15 days. You have 15 days um, or longer, again, if you need more time and are acting in good faith to receive the certification. So I wanted to just pause here and give some information about where to go to reach us. Um, you can have clients or patients or people that you work with um, and provide services to contact us themselves. Um, but we also are happy to provide technical assistance um, to anyone who might need um, answers to these types of questions. Um, so here is a link to our website. Um, Legal Aid at Work. And again, we're in the Work and Family Program. We provide free confidential legal advice in multiple languages. So feel free to call us with questions or concerns about paid family leave, um, how to apply, if you experience a denial of, of claims, anything like that, um, as well as questions or concerns about job protected leave rights, including denial of leave or retaliation or discrimination by an employer. Um, and here's the helpline, which again, you should feel free to also send folks our way or call yourselves um, for technical assistance. So Sharon again mentioned earlier um, that we have some resources for how to apply for paid family leave um, if you are undocumented. And so I wanted to just walk through these steps now, um, but also highlight that we have um, a guide, a one page a fact sheet, but also a longer guide accessible on our website. Um, so the first step is just to request a paper application from the EDD 
Um, second would be to complete and submit the application, leaving the social security number field blank, and then also attaching a letter and proof of wages. And then to follow up with the EDD, um, there will be follow up from the EDD. Uh, they may call you again and look out for that um, sort of undefined number. Um, and then the person should um, be able to receive their benefits. So if you have additional questions about that um, or need access to these resources, feel free to call us and we're happy to talk further. I also wanted to point out um, another resource that we have, which is a guide for misclassified workers. So this guide provides information and guidance for workers who may have been misclassified as independent contractors. Um, they may still be eligible for paid family leave, even though um, typically independent contractors do not automatically pay into the fund, so they may not be eligible. Um, but there are you know, many people in, in California who may be misclassified incorrectly. And so this guide provides options to just read through the question to sort of determine if the worker has been misclassified and then also has guidance on what to do next or how to apply. We also have a, a fact sheet and resource um, called caregiving in my job. Um, and so this has, details about many of the things that we've talked about today, um, but can be helpful to provide to um, folks that you work with and serve. Um, so they have that information, even if you go over it with them. Um, and um, I think we can also arrange sending some um, paper forms um, if or paper fact sheets if um, that would be interesting to you. Um, and so feel free to visit our website for more information. And um, I wanted to highlight too that coming soon, we should have a new fact sheet for specific tips applying for intermittent paid family leave, which again, we spoke about, but I know can be um, tricky. So look out for that. And with that, I just wanna open it up for questions. Again, please feel free to reach, our, reach us on our website um, or send people our way for free legal advice and information, um, technical assistance, guides and fact sheets. And I will leave this slide up just so you have the number of where to send us. Um, and let's see, I know there have been some questions in the chat. So I will look to see it. Sharon, do you have any that you um, would like to answer real time? Um yeah, and we can also invite folks to raise their hand um, if you want to unmute and ask your questions. Um, but I'll try to also, um, and we will, um, Jennifer, we will share um, links to all of our fact sheets with the recording as well. Um, so let's see. I'm looking for raised hands, but in the meantime, we can start looking at the chat um, and answer some questions there. Um, okay. So, um, Jen, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Hi. Um, you might have covered this a little bit already, but um, did you talk at all about teachers? Because I know they have different schedules and they work, you know, like one year is not like a whole year. Um, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's two things to keep in mind there. So um, many public school teachers and public employees in general do not pay into the state disability insurance fund. Okay. So, um, so the first thing to do is to check that the person actually is eligible for a paid family leave. The, if they have not paid in, they're not going to be eligible and they should consult HR and or um, their union to see what benefits may be available. Okay. And then the second thing is with respect to job protected leave, you're right that there are some special rules for instructional employees um, and um, they that have to do with exactly like the timing of your leave um, and whether you're approaching the end or the beginning of a school year. Um, so I would recommend that if folks are in that circumstance, they should call our helpline and we can walk them through um, those special rules. Excellent. Okay, definitely we'll call. Well, thank you very much. Of course. Um, other questions. I did see a question in the chat about federal employees, which is somewhat related. Um, and that is um, that federal employees also don't pay in 
to um, paid family leave to the state disability insurance fund. And so they're, um, and they also are not eligible for job protected leave under the California Family Rights Act. But if they meet the requirements for the federal Family and Medical Leave Act, then they would have similar entitlements to those 12 weeks of job protected leave with health insurance continued. Um, Catherine? Hi, yeah, I have two questions related to the paid family leave. And one was if the $1,620 a week cap is across the board, like no matter what someone's income is, that's the max they would get in benefits? Yes, that's right. Um, that's correct. Okay. Um, but just to clarify that, um, it's only the highest earners who will receive that max. So, um, so yeah, if you have to be making over a certain amount in order to get that maximum, um, in general, folks who are um, earning very, very low wages um, will get 70% of their income and um, everyone else will get 60% um, up to that cap. Okay. And then the question about how you can apply every year if you still need the time off for to be a caregiver, is that every calendar year or every year from when you started your first request? If you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I do know what you're saying. Yes, um, that is a great question. For paid family leave purposes, it's basically every year from when you first took leave. So in any given 12 month period, you can take eight weeks of paid family leave. For job protected leave, the rules are slightly different. Essentially, the employer can designate their leave year. Um, so the employer can say, for our for our workers, the leave year is a calendar year or the fiscal year, or it's a look back from when you first took the leave. So they do need to tell their employees what the leave year is. And if they fail to tell the employees that, then the employee gets to choose the leave year that works best for them. Thanks. Other questions? Sharon, there's a few other questions that came in the chat earlier. Yeah, um, do you wanna? If yeah, you let, me, let me pull a couple few. So one around the eight weeks a year, what happens if you now are caring for a different family member? Does that change how frequently you could take it? So we know this does come up and um, unfortunately, no, there is a maximum of eight weeks per year for paid family leave. Um, but again, you can apply again in the next 12 um, month period. And um, yeah. Right. So unfortunately, uh, even if you have multiple folks in your family who are seriously ill, or let's say you have a baby and your mom is sick, it's just going to be the eight weeks um, per year. Okay. And can you clarify, what is the definition of seriously ill? Do you want to take yeah. that one, Sailor, or do you want me to? Sure. I can also go back to our previous slide. Just give me a second. Um, so sorry for this, if it makes you, <laughs> so what counts as a serious health condition? It can be a physical or mental condition, impairment, illness, or injury that involves continuing treatment by a healthcare provider. Um, or also if the um, person receiving care, um, is requiring inpatient care. And here are some examples, um, that we spoke about before. Yeah. And then there's a couple questions related to filling out the forms. And I think particularly given that our audience is a lot of providers and probably social workers, um, and these might be related. One about how does a healthcare provider certify if you fill out the application online? And then do you have any recommendations for providers completing Part D and mailing it separately to a, a care provider's online application? So I don't know if you could just clarify how that works when people are filling it out online and then also needing to get the, um, the certification piece. Yeah, um, so providers can certify online or with the paper application. I know that different practices have preferences about that. Um, it is possible to do either. And, um, and essentially there ideally is a way to kind of link them up. So if the, if the employee has 
applied, they will get kind of a claim number and eventually they'll get matched by the EDD. Um, so hopefully that, that helps. But again, happy to answer all sorts of questions like this. And so really welcome you all to call our helpline if you have specific um, questions. You know, we, we, we often get lots of questions from folks who've attended our trainings and uh, we really like those questions and we want to um, provide support to you all to support your, uh, the folks you work, you work with to get these benefits. Um, and folks can, you know, the, the, the people you work with, of course, can call us directly as well. And so there was a related one to this that medical providers often seem to prefer the paper application. So it sounds like that shouldn't be an issue. It'll get matched up on the EDD side. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, a couple other questions related to the forms as well. Is a care recipient residential address supposed to be their permanent address? Or if they are, say, living with the caregiver at that time, should it be that address instead? Um. I don't think it really matters um, actually where the care recipient is living. Um, so that it should be fine either way. Um, what's more important is the care provider where that person is living and where they're going to get the communications from the employment development department. Right. And then a couple questions related to the EDD. Do you know how long the turnaround time for processing an application is? And then particularly the timeline of when to expect a call from them, given how many spam calls there are and concern about um, abuse and what information they're giving out, you know, how to help people determine that this is a legitimate call and you really should talk to them. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in terms of um, how to tell if it's them, you know, unfortunately, it, it, we have been, heard that it comes from um, an undetected number. And so I know there are a lot of spam calls, but I would say if you have recently filed an application, I would, you know, within um, a couple of weeks, I would expect that someone might give you a call then. So it, it's not an exact science, but I would maybe be available to take a call within the next, you know, several weeks after you, you have um, submitted your application. Um, and in terms of turnaround time, again, we know that can sometimes change. Um, typically, we I know that the department um, tries to get turnaround within a couple weeks, two weeks, um, but we also know that um, there can be delays just depending on different things. So um, if you haven't heard anything for many, many weeks or you're, someone comes to, to speak with you and they're concerned about their application, again, you can um, refer them to our helpline um, if it's been, you know, a long, long time and they haven't heard a single peep um, from the EDD. And I'll just add to that, there's a, a helpful function on the EDD's website called Ask EDD. And it's available at askedd.ca.edd.gov. I'll put that in the chat. Um, and there is a way to actually ask, um, to send a free form message to the EDD that they um, are a little bit faster at returning than, than calls. It's hard to reach them on the phone. Um, and so that's another option. But again, like Sayla said, if folks have just had radio silence from the EDD, um, please feel free to have them call us. And we, we also have kind of a, um, a, a line, communication line to them as, to ask for updates on um, special cases where folks are reaching, you know, or facing systemic barriers. I saw that um, John had a question. Yes. The question is if a worker is submitting uh, just by telling the employer that they're going to be needing to take leave, when does the paperwork for FMLA or CFRA get required? Okay. Okay. That's a great question. So um, <clears throat> if an employee says to their employer, I need leave to care for my mom who is in the hospital, for example, um, the employer has a duty to tell that employee what their obligations are with respect to that leave. And they should do it in writing and they should say, okay, you're eligible for 12 weeks of job protected leave under the California Family Rights Act and the FMLA, if that applies. Um, and here's what we need from you. We need you to fill out this medical, have your healthcare provider, your family member's healthcare provider fill out this medical certification form. You have 15 days to do so, um, more if you need more time. Um, and then, 
that's sort of how that works. If the employer just says, okay, you can take the leave um, and they don't require medical certification, then there is no affirmative duty on the part of the employee to provide that paperwork. Um, we would recommend, as, a, as we mentioned, you know, following up with an email just to make it super clear and so that there's not a dispute later on. Um, you know, thanks for talking with me today. As I mentioned, my mom is in the hospital and I need leave to care for her serious health condition. As we discussed, I'm going to be taking leave from this date to this date. Please let me know if you need anything more from me. And then you're sort of covered, if that makes sense. And keep a copy of those emails. So we recommend, you know, forwarding that to your personal email or printing it out um, so that, you know, there's not a, a, a question later about what, what communications um, happened about your leave. Thank you. Yeah. There's other questions. Sharon, there was one more in the chat about if somebody needs leave for their own medical condition. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, so if you need leave for your own medical condition, um, it's actually somewhat similar. Um, essentially, you have a separate, um, if, you, if you pay into the state disability insurance program, then you are entitled to not eight weeks, but up to 52 weeks of wage replacement benefits for your own um, non-workplace related illness or disability. Um, and that actually could be in addition to the eight weeks of paid family leave. So, um, so that is um, one wage replacement benefit that is available to folks in California for their own illness. And then in terms of job protection, um, you can get 12 weeks of leave with job protection under the California Family Rights Act if you meet those requirements that we talked about before. Um, but actually, you might be entitled to even more time if you have what is considered a disability under California law. And then what would happen is if you let's say you ex you meet your 12 weeks, you take your 12 weeks, you need more time. You can ask for more time as a reasonable accommodation of your disability. And the employer um, should give that to you um, as long as it's not an undue hardship. And again, we have sample letters for healthcare providers. We have sample request letters on our website um, and happy to give individualized advice and really would recommend folks to, to call us um, and uh, for any of these kind of specific questions. Um, I, know, I know we're gonna, a, a, a survey is gonna be popped up at once you leave the Zoom and just wanna put a plug in, please, please fill out that survey. We really want, uh, value your feedback and wanna, improve our trainings and know what's helpful, what's not. Um, and Sayla just put that in the chat as well. Um, do we have time for one more or are we out of time? Um, we're almost out of time. If there's one last question that someone wants to get in though, um, feel free to, to jump in. I, I know there were a few in the chat and I know you addressed this about just the limitations of, of who is considered family under the law. Do you have a sense of, of when you're going to propose legislation that would expand it to match the Family Rights Act, when we might see that move forward, and, and if there's places for people to advocate to help support the passage of that? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, so there, we expect that legislation to be um, moving through this session. Um, Assemblymember Buffy Wicks, I believe, is the author. Um, and um, would recommend that folks, folks are welcome to reach out to us. We'll be helping to advocate for that. If you want to get involved and share stories or your perspective, write off eds, we would welcome um, your participation. And also um, the California Work and Family Coalition is the coalition that we are also um, a part of and that is advocating for this um, legislation and, and other um, bills to improve work family supports, including expanded paid sick days. Um, so, um, and that is, um, let's see, I think it's workfamilyca.org. But um, folks can reach out to them or us at Legal Aid at Work. Um, and say that, um, I think what the last slide has our contact information. Is that right? We can put it in here too. And I know that we'll be sharing the, the recording. 
So yeah, we will send out the recording, um, copy the slides. There's and we'll resend the survey link as well in that follow-up email. So um, we will get that out to everybody. Here's a few days just to, to clean up the recording and make sure that we get rid of all of our, our intro discussion before we started the, the meeting. Um, but we'll get that out to everybody um, probably early next week. But thank you so much, Sayla and Sharon, for being here and sharing all of this. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, their contact information is in the chat. So feel free to reach out um, to Sharon Sayla or the phone number through Legal Aid at Work. And then look for an email that will come from Family Caregiver Alliance with all the follow-up information from today. Um, we really appreciate you all joining us today. And thanks for being here. Um, and again, thank you, Sharon and Sayla. And yeah, any last questions, we'll hang for maybe one more minute, but thanks everyone and have a good Friday and weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh -huh.